Sojourn, Part 2, The Vargad Emnus. On a distant planet, the Creod, Roik, has orders to kill all Mantari inferiors. Mantaris are prototypes of humans that descended into the human race. Sard is the leader of all the Vargats. His goal is to find the seventh Mantari Urkum or planet. They look over the fourth Urkum, an extensive Mantari presence is indicated. He longs for his own home planet with the Urkum swamps and the foggy areas way deep beneath the clouds. Sarad says the Mantari will suffer the sins of their Taban Shar ancestors. He looks out to the city. He lands his craft in the meadow. He does not believe in an inner force such as the Taban Shah possesses to their Mantari descendants. He lowers his matrix shield as he steps into the Azor of the sun. There's a fire fight going on and red saurine or blood is dripping from the flesh of the inferiors, the Mantari. He uses his craw, an extended claw that sticks from his appendage to rip the flesh of the Mantari enemy. Those that survive will be brought back to the vessel for the Hamian Salter games where they will be placed before creatures and devoured before Sard and his crew. The leader of the planet, the Tolton, is concerned as panic spreads as the Creod attack continues from the sky. Green beams rip like lightning through the forest. He rides through the gates of his city on his Alpha Sahars to confer with the Plavka, the ancient leaders. The Tolton does not believe in the Taban Shah, but now he is desperate. He descends below the city to find the ancient knowledge below our depictions of the Battle of Golgar where the Creods vanquished the Taban Shah from their home planet, and the Taban Shah fled to places unknown. The Tolton has doubts about Taban Shah, but he has no options. One hundred Creods have submitted their lives to Sard, the leader of this brutal race. From his ship, the Aragasta, he proclaims a death empire on Alta Shah below. He wants to remove all vestige of the Taban Shah from the Humea, the galaxy. The leaders of the Creods, the upper echelon, are effective from their home planet location above the clouds. Sard will no longer follow their orders. He established the Death Empire to save the realm from all inferiors. Everyone will report to Sard. He will offer up the Urkum to the Aragasta. He extends his gray craw and shouts out. He wishes the presence of Anka. Get me Anka, he says, one of the oldest Creod Vargats. Anka speaks of Taban Shah's final battle, predicted in their saber, the ancient writings. Sarad says, They have you believing their stories. Anka mentions the Suri of Khan, the one who will save his people from the Creod hordes. Anka reads quotes from the saber, as Sarad communicates on a secure Osbart channel to the upper echelon on the home planet. The echelon will not let Sarad continue hunting the Mantari. Saad flails about once the channel ends. He was the one marching with his salvets on the home planet against the Taban Shah while the Echelon did nothing. He will absorb the Echelon and take the home Urkum. Saad sways his sword, his westick, over the inferiors. Saad wants to find the rune below the fortress. He's looking for the Tolton. Then Sard confronts the Plavka. They stand before Sard as he slices their necks and then chops the inferior's body into small pieces and places it in the food bin for other inferiors to consume. Then he orders the complete vaporization of this Urkum. The defensive shield has fallen. The Tolton will not survive the vaporization, says Sard. Where is the Taban Shar? Why is there not an energy source? Saad returns to his vessel. Skulls of the inferiors will be placed in the wall galleries, but he still cannot find the Taban Shar or the energy source. His main purpose now is to topple the upper echelon. Saad is brought to the bridge, the Icean. The upper echelon wants to stop destruction of the planet. He sets up an Osborne channel to the upper echelon. Two of their leaders, Balchek and Ayak, speak to Saad directly. Sard will be reassigned to a more peaceful mission. Sard is livid, off-channel. He threatens to kill them all. Sard tells his Selvits that they must prepare for the final battle with the Suri of Khan. 
Back on the intergalactic passageway, Loftus and Zack have spent 153 days traversing this green ocean. There is a glow on the horizon. This is an endless energy sea. Another vessel passes in the distance. It's blue and outlined in the darkness like a ghost ship. He spots Kath, Frank DeLuger, and John in this blue outline. How can this be possible? Zack suggests maybe a dimensional warp, that maybe they had escaped Bathurst. Zack then sees slumps on the horizon. Zack mentions that old time feeling as lights move up the mountain. Beings with luminescent blue eyes move forward. They are able to communicate without speaking. He tells them his name, and they are called the Greaves. Somehow, he thinks he was here long ago. The passageway warps time and space, clothing and knowledge and culture. He and Zack will be given the clothing and knowledge of the culture. They are lifted by the Greaves onto glass cubes. Clothing and boots form as they move down the ramp and into the village they separate. Ahead, he sees a huge animal, a cross between a brontosaurus and a horse. There are muscular dogs walking the village. The village is filled with activity. And all the while, he doesn't know how, but he thinks he must keep trusting in Taban Shah. He sits on a weathered wooden bench looking for Zack, but doesn't see him. Sard misinforms the upper echelon and says that he needs to bring the Aragosta in for repairs on an Urkum called Serban. This is where he will plan his attack on the home planet. All of his Vargat officers are in agreement with the attack on the upper echelon, a rebellion. Sard reminds them that he had personally led the home planet against the Taban Shah and pushed them out of the 26 Urkums of the realm. In the upper windows is a bright glow, like the sun from the outside light. Up front is a huge white bench, high, with clerks sitting in black robes. They state his name, Loftus, as the tribunal comes out. The tribunal is there to address all blasphemies. Shocking Loftus is Frank DeLuca, who now goes by the name of Orkan, who is one of the members of the tribunal. There's a list of charges read. DeLuca stops the proceedings to defend Loftus. He says that the Necros village are defenders of the Tolton and that Loftus has nothing to do with Taban Shah. He is loyal to the Tolton in the Mead, the village where they are presently. DeLuca skews all the testimony, but what destroys Loftus is Roas appearing from the prison they have exchanged his testimony for his own freedom. He speaks of the Bunshaft, which implicates Loftus as a believer in Tabunshaft. Sentence will be read and carried out. He will be sentenced to death in the acid pit of the arena tomorrow. Loftus sits in a small grid cell overlooking the stadium where he will be executed tomorrow. Frank DeLuca appears from the corridor and enters the cell. DeLuca has been in the Mead for 23 years since his arrival via the intergalactic passageway in the Time Warp. Kath is 23 years older, and she is married to the Tolton. DeLuca says he's read illegal copies of the Saber and finds it to be credible. Kath made her own decision back in Appleton to become involved with Loftus's problem. The next morning, guards kick him, waking him up. Loftus is marched into the hall. He wonders if DeLuca had spoken to Kath about commuting his sentence. He's brought into the stadium for killing. Dark circular pools filled with acid inundate the arena area. Scaffolding has been set up. Skeletal remains are removed from the acid and the bones deposited in a large heap. Loftus cries out that he's innocent of these charges. There are chutes moving down from the scaffolding, circling around into the Kadir, the acid pit. Guards continuously read charges of the convicted men. DeLuca is sitting in the stands next to other men from the tribunal. Up in the regal box, a sandy-haired man sits with the brilliant white-haired calf as she drinks from a goblet and watch people being executed. They shove Loftus up the stairs. Another man ahead of him tumbles down the chute and hits the acid. Before Loftus is pushed down the chute, a man talks to him 
a man he has never seen before. The man tells him to trust in Tabun Shah. The inner vengeance is not the way. He makes eye contact with Kath. Her eyes are packed with venom, and then she rises and leaves the stadium. DeLuca gestures as people scream for Loftus's death. Loftus looks down the chute. Some men are shoveling granules into the pit, producing a sulfur odor. They shove him and he swiftly spirals down the chute. He hits the surface, but the liquid does not burn him. Someone underneath grabs his arm and drags him through an opening into a tube. He lands in a stone pool as the water from the tank is purged. He's issued new cloths by a man named Yarish, loyal to DeLuca. He says, good fortune to you. DeLuca appears down below. Loftus talks about Cass' hatred and long white hair. Frank DeLuca makes a joke and says he doesn't look bad for a dead man. DeLuca has made a deal. Loftus will be sent to the morgue. Loftus really doesn't know what this is, but he does know this is a violent, sick society completely controlled by the Tolton. It's the inner vengeance weaving its way into this planet. The morgue is thousands of miles away. Luca tells him, it's either the morgue or you would have died. You have a destiny, my friend. Follow your heart, not your head. I think, said DeLuca, having studied the saber, you are the Suri of Khan. DeLuca turns and says, good fortune to you and good life, Desperado. They march Loftus to the warehouse once DeLuca leaves. Loftus can't believe that Kath was sadistically enjoying the spectacle of death in the arena. He climbs into a Camino cage with other prisoners and the Guampus brings them away from the Mead. A man up front says, the Tolton has spared your lives. Loftus leans back under the stars and watches the Mead fade away as he thinks about Tab and Shah. Back on the home planet of Kriod, Bachek looks out the portal at the other Kriods. Elkin, loyal to Sard, has called for a full military alert. He had feared giving Sard power. They ask, where is Sard? Upon which Elkin tells him that the Urkin Serban is the source of the attack. There's interference, however, around Serban. They mention that Tabun Shah was defeated at Galga. Now Sard has plotted to kill you. Sard is apprehended. Balchark yells out about the arrogance of Sard. Sard is suspended, but not really, from a yestic field. Bachok threatens to torture Sard. You will plead for mercy, Sard. The alert will stay in place until Sard is brought to justice on the home planet. Once the communication ends, Sard says he will take the outposts and supplies before he takes the home Urkham. They never suspected Sard was in full control of his powers. Sard says he remembers loyalty. And then the Hamian Salta games begin. The campaign against the upper echelon will be worthy of past glories. We will need the shooters from the defensive outposts, and then they will find Tabun Shar. For Tabun Shar has no leaders, only followers. First, Sard must take back what is his. Sard studies the tacticals for the outpost. Fully charged shooters are in place at the outpost station. The Amperage, the fleet, all his salvets are thirsty for battle. Sard is a traitor, says one of the Poraskas. He makes it a point to say he wants to witness Sard's torture. Sard moves toward the Proaska. As the Proaska pleads for mercy, Sard hacks and mutilates the Creod. He begins the attack, and no one at the outpost will be spared. Loftus is in a rolling Camino. Trees are scarce beyond the straw grass plains. In the distance, there's a settlement rising from the heat. Once in the morgue, the courtyard, morgue soldiers abound. They are taken out of the Camino. A stocky man in a red uniform, the Overcore, approaches. All stragglers will be eliminated. If they tried to get back to the Mead, it would take months on foot. They would be fed a liquid called Solub from bowls. They will live underground, away from the world. Loftus looks up at the water tower against the stars. There are men dressed in white uniforms called transporters. They are the weak ones and traitor to the herbals, the Mantari who live below the surface. The last thing they want to do is alert the Overcore's guard called the Korabs. 
Loftus is beaten and he goes unconscious. Loftus awakens, his eyes swollen. There's an old man with a wispy gray beard looking down at him, as are the other herbals, deep below the surface of the planet. Where am I? he asked. They just say he's underground, as a man named Cabius, the leader, is summoned. Cabius tells Loftus never to trust the transporters. We all share the Noma. The Noma is the worship place to Tabanshar, a hollowed out dome in the rocks below the surface. Eskers, the high priests of the dome, are told about Loftus' Bunshaf. They read the ancient words and say he is the Suri of Khan, the one who will save the Mantari people. In time, all your questions will be answered. Loftus gains back strength. He thinks back to the learned men on Altashar when he was a boy. No one has ever heard of Altashar. The higher civilization of Tabanshar was attacked by the Creods. Inside the Noma, there is a balanced scale. He reads from the Saber, learning more and more as the days pass about the Tabanshar and about the interventions. It is fear that fuels the interventions possessed by the Creod race. You are being summoned, the Eskers tell him, by Tabun Shah. You have a responsibility. It is written what you must do. It has been laid out for you long ago. Follow your heart, and all your paths will be made straight. Remove the inner vengeance from the universe. Back on Creod, Bachak is happy about Sard being restrained in the Yestic fields. He will be a witness to Sard's humiliation and death. Bachak orders more ships, Azakars, to move out. Elkin wants to know why they're taking positions against them. Six man tarry prisoners, says Sard, will have inserted ardent enclosures, explosives, put in them, and the upper echelon will believe what they wish to believe, as the prisoners are brought onto the home Urkum. Sard is placed in the Yestic field to make it appear as though he was restrained. Elkin looks at him and tells him, You will become the supreme ruler of all that is. One of the upper echelon contacts, Jakra is trying to take command and scolds Sard. Sard says he does not recognize Jakra's power. Below the surface on the planet with the herbals, Loftus marches with the herbals into the Noma. He has become increasingly curious about the words of Tavan Shah. The community somehow survives underground in the Noma cave. As they resonate, the scales return to an equilibrium. Cabius asks Loftus to learn the words of Taban Shah. The Esker stands by the aisle resonating. Loftus feels an overwhelming destiny. His mind is taken away to slabs in a reflective pool, red light in a towering clear pyramid. He now knows he must unite the planet and find the Bunshah. He must leave this place. All the enclaves in the morgue must join together. Loftus is perched above them all on a bench. In reciting the words of Tabun Shah, he lifts the saber upward and he wears his bunshaf proudly to the herbals of the Noma. They must search for the lost ones, the Death Empire, the enemy, the destroyer. Unite, 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 he calls out. We will conquer the Overcore's garrison above. We will unite all our people against the Creod hordes. Alkin is studying the other ships as they move toward the home Urkum. He cannot alert the echelon by having a full shoot of battle. Sard taunts the inferiors. He will put them as skulls in Sard's death empire. Sard never forgets those who betrayed him. The inferiors are badgering Sard. Sard fully exposes his fangs. Remember your words when you have fallen to the clouds, my dear friend. Elkin studies the Nikitim. The shuttle is in place and the cluster towers come into view where the upper echelon is waiting. Sard appears to be suspended in the Yestic field. He orders the home Urkum targeted. Sard receives such adulation after defeating Tab and Shar at Galga. Ayak, one of the members of the upper echelon, is in the outer chambers. They all thank Jakra for bringing Sard to justice. Sard is now inside the Echelon Towers. Sard has no respect for any of these cowards. Only Sard can lead us to a greater destiny. Treason, yells Bocek. Let the torture begin. Elkin does not pay homage. All the defensive outposts are already ready at my order, he tells him. Sard speaks through the strained fields. Outpost shooters are aimed at the Echelon Towers. Then he gives the order. Right. 
destroy the Martus. Jocker is shocked. Chunks tumble down. Release the Vargat Garmin or more will fall, says Roy. Bachak backs down and moves across the room and releases Sard. All the upper echelon members leave the room. So you challenge Sard. You will pay homage to Sard. He lifts Bachak upward, hurls him against the wall. Bachak is telling, I beg you, Sard, save me. He throws Jakra into the cold air. You can serve Sard best by dying. Sard has taken over the Echelon Towers. He will take back what is rightly his. Let the reign of Sard begin. In the swamp, Sard returns to his Bertha, Poit. He will accept the title of Bargain Emnus. All inferiors, said Sard, deserve death. He enters the Ankita, the hut. He bears the burden of Tabanshah, but where are the Tabanshah? Heaper surges exist, displacing time and space, and he speaks of his brother Tark and how his loss has been great. Hoyt says that Sard must fulfill his destiny. In the Great Hall, surrounded by thousands of Creods, Sard is about to be crowned the Vargat Emnus. All the realm will listen. He will be unchallenged. The music stops and he again thinks of his brother Tark. Battle tapestries are brought in and tribal songs are sung. Elkin lifts the helmets from the ancient battles. Sard meditates and stands and then he speaks. Two of the Echelon members, Frond and Ayak, plead for mercy. One of them yells out, spare me, Sard. All the realm submits to Sard. Sard returns to his throne. Mantaria dragged in, and the Karsic Torsic swamp animal enters the room and devours the inferiors. Roik now appears at Sard's side. He has news of great importance. Voice contact from Tark. Sard slowly stands and asks where. Crossing an ocean between the Urkums, the prophecies in the Saber. They use this ocean to travel. There's power there to connect the Urkums, yet they are still defeated. Tark speaks on a message from 1957 AD. The Urkum is called Earth. Tark has discovered one of the two remaining Mantari Urkums. Sard will find this Mantari Earth, but more Azakars are needed. A battle must take place. Sard knows he will face the Suri of Khan in the final battle. Herbal leaders debate Loftus as wanting to challenge the Overcore. Babka is in one of the herbals stirring up trouble. Loftus thinks of Zack and Isaac Watkins. He is inspired by Tabun Shah. This attack will have to be quick, but Bobker has disappeared. Arrows are flying in the passageway and Cabius has a knife. Like crabs, they move along the main shaft. Bobker is struck in the leg. They inform Bobka to tell the Overcore the attack will be tomorrow night and not tonight. Bobker is trying to see the Overcore later. The Overcore, it turns out, is John Grady, Loftus' son. He meets Loftus. There will be no attack now. This planet must be unified. He talks about the Tolton's control and how far they are out here in the morgue, how he was sent out here and banished. They send word below, as some of the Yerbals call Loftus a traitor. Loftus realizes there was no hope when Kath had married the Tolton. He's repeating he must trust in Tav and Cha. The Korobs are in position as John and Loftus crawl out. John says he had no choice. There are Korobs at the door. Loftus somehow knows by resonating to Tav and Cha that they will defeat the Korobs. He says they should hitch a Guampus to the Camino and then tie it to the water tower. The water tower is then toppled. There are wounded and dead, and the lake forms on the inside of the garrison. They fight their way out the front gates. Loftus now says he must trust in Tom and Shah. And remember, to follow your heart, says Cabius. Cabius and his people says they will find their way. Through the spongy soil, they move outside into the twinkling desert sky. Loftus says he feels like an object being taken downstream.